aliens have been around since the dawn of time. Mankind has given them many names. Angels, ghosts, demons and more. We look to the skies and wonder. But the truth about aliens visiting planet Earth is much more profound. It is so startling and so strange that nobody has thought to look in that particular direction. Our ancestors developed ways of contacting these aliens and they called them gods. They were beings of light, shining ones, watchers. They were both good and bad, mirroring humanity. They gave great knowledge, and after tens of thousands of years, mankind suddenly had the ability to create civilization. We built huge monuments in their name, and we recorded our contact with them in fables, myths, legends, folklore, and religion. We even created grand myths, such as Atlantis, to explain it. They were our gods, and we worshipped them and recorded their powers, deeds, and lives. These gods of the world were in fact not real gods, whatever that means. They were in fact alien invaders, and we were the subjects of their rule. This is the true story of the aliens in the ancient world. Over 5,000 years before Christ, an amazing thing happened that would change the course of human history. Hidden from us by misunderstanding, mistranslation, and clouded in mythology, the birth of religion on this planet was no mere accident. It was the result of an alien invasion on a vast scale, and it sparked the worship of the ancient aliens as gods those gods are the oldest recorded figures of worship anywhere in history. They are the root of all the major world religions. They gave rise to the great powers of Egypt, Mesopotamia, and more. They gave rise to the fable of Atlantis, a superior race who ruled over mankind with superior intellect and technology. Those people with knowledge of this created secret societies to keep the history alive. We know them today as the Illuminati. They spread outwards around the world and were the genesis of a special holy bloodline that remains with us today. One of their descendants would be caught, beaten, and crucified. And yet, he would rise from his grave unrecognizable and accompanied by messengers of light. He would ascend in the sky, having cast off his shrouded skin. His bloodline would give rise to the royal families of the entire world. His bloodline would be protected, defended, and would control the globe. He was a descendant of the great serpent elite who came to this earth as beings of light to create, control, and teach mankind. He was a descendant of the great giant killer, David, a memory of a great battle that was fought between the serpent elite and the sons of alien and man. All of this is actually written in the historical records. They were known as giants in the land, the aliens escaped Earth, but left behind their seed and tools of power and communication. It is prophesied that they shall return, and the signs are growing daily that they have returned and are right now dealing with their own elite bloodline, the men in power. Original worship on this planet is that of the serpent. That is historical fact. And yet it is within every single religion. It is in all the myths of the world. And they all tell the same story. In the beginning, the serpent was the wise one, the only animal in the Bible to speak freely with his own mind and voice. 
the tempter, and yet also the holder of ultimate wisdom and the elixir of life. Mankind, in comparison to this remarkable animal, appeared foolish. From that day forward, the serpent would control man. That serpent was quite possibly a reptilian alien holding the technological power to modify and seed humanity and the wisdom of another civilization. The very genetic makeup of mankind would have been altered from this moment. We cannot say exactly when. We cannot pinpoint the so-called Garden of Eden in time. But we can piece together the remarkable story of the serpent aliens who came from the skies. We can uncover the story of what happened next and how it has affected our own reality. It is said that the aliens do walk among us right now. To many, the very idea that the serpent is hidden within our religions and mythology will seem bizarre. In Christianity and other faiths, it is reviled, and this itself is a folk memory of a fearful and warring past between mankind and the serpent aliens. Nevertheless, the historical truth is that the serpent is there at the root of all major religions. This has been proven again and again, both from scriptures and archaeology. Over thousands of years and across hundreds of cultures, the history of this ancient invasion by the great shining ones from the heavens altered and became legend and myth. Much of it turned into the great religions of the planet, but hidden in these stories is the real, literal truth of an invasion of planet Earth by being so strange that we called them serpents. Ancient man left carvings, renderings, and cave paintings with tales of their coming across the world. The great guardians of the Shining Ones, known as the Watchers, mated with human females and a hybrid bloodline was born. It became the bloodline of the rulers of our globe and was protected and kept secret. In truth, this was the period of the ancient invasion of planet Earth by the shining beings who came from the sky. Our ancestors worshipped them for their amazing power. But now, in our modern scientific age, we can now see things more clearly. These were not angels or messengers of light. These were not great Greek deities sat on high and issuing commands. They were not the many-faced Hindu or Egyptian gods. These were beings from another planet or dimension who came here with superior technology. They created mankind as the Egyptian Book of the Dead states I am the Lord of the Red Crown, which is on the head of the Shining One, he who gives life to mankind from the heat of his mouth. They guided mankind through the process of civilization. They bred with us, and they fought with each other over control of us. Most, we are told, left, but the hybrid race remained among us as special people. And now, with every passing day, NASA tell us that they have discovered yet another Earth-like planet that could sustain life. They find ancient rivers and lakes on Mars, and even amino acids and bacteria within the Martian soil. They alter their equations on the existence of alien life on a weekly basis. It seems they are growing more and more aware that soon, they will discover something special. The question is, will we awaken the ancient invaders? And will they return if they're not already here? There are many ancient sightings of aliens and unidentified flying objects throughout history. One of the first is the disputed Thule Papyrus account, which describes, quote, fiery disks encountered floating over the skies. 
but there are even older sightings. The Ubaid period runs from 6,500 to 3,800 BC and is a prehistoric period of Mesopotamia. With all the knowledge we have of the widespread form of serpent worship, we look at this remote historical period for more clues, and we actually don't have to look too far. The Ubaid female serpent mother goddess is an image of precisely what we have been discussing. She is the giver of life and an early form of Mary the Mother of God. She is a reptilian serpent being. She is from the very origins of civilization. Is this a symbol of the origin of mankind? Did reptilian aliens genetically create man? In fact, the ancient Sumerian myths of Enuma Elis inscribed on cuneiform tablets that reside in the library of Ashurbanipal, says humankind was created to serve gods called the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki were aliens who came to Earth to mine gold for their own uses. According to the Enuma Elish story, the Anunnaki realized mining gold was taking a toll on their race and then created the human race as slaves. Let's also take a look at the Elohim for a moment to find out who these gods were that enslaved men and were in charge of the Watchers. The term Elohim, used often in the Old Testament and other texts outside of it, as in the Muslim Allah for the Lord, this is an incorrect usage, as the term is plural and means shining ones. We can see this plurality in the text from Genesis 1.26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And again in Genesis 6.2, The sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. This term, sons of God, is literally sons of gods and comes from Ben Ha Elohim, sons of the shining ones. Baal, the deity often spoken as the Lord in the Bible, is also seen as a shining one in the Old Testament and is called the owner. At that time, there were many owners or shining ones. In fact, there was one for each village. These are the governors of the first men, shining reptilian alien beings with vast knowledge whose existence has been passed down to us in religious texts, fables, folklore, and myths. According to General Albert Pike, the most famous Masonic historian, in Morals and Dogma, the Elohim were the host of heaven, ascending and descending to pass messages to and from God or the leader Yahweh. These beings came down to us from the heavens and back again. If this doesn't imply evidence of ancient aliens, then what does? Interestingly, some of the Shining Ones were termed Watchers and are akin to the angels of the Lord. Yahweh Elohim means simply leader of the Shining Ones. The Egyptian Book of the Dead calls these watchers Anubis and Horus, who came from a faraway place. The Hebrews termed these watchers as those who watch. In Greek, this is translated as giantess or giants a race that even the writer Hesiod featured as being monstrous due to their serpentine aspect. Now we can understand the role of giants that are seen across the world of folklore as perhaps a historical revision to portray the original alien watchers. These watchers, according to the Book of Jubilees, are the Son of God spoken of in Genesis sent from their heavenly abode to instruct men. What seems to have occurred 
is that they fell from grace by mating with the daughters of men and were thus outcast, giving us the fallen angels we are familiar with today and indeed the tales of Atlantis. The fallen watchers swear an oath and bind themselves together. The place of this action is called Ardis, the fabled summit of Mount Hermon, which derives from the Hebrew word for curse. Following these actions of the fallen watchers, the shining ones called down a great flood upon the earth to destroy the offspring, and Noah is warned to build a great ship to escape the impending catastrophic doom. There was obviously some great battle between the dissenters and the shining ones and the loyal watchers, which gave rise to the archangels Michael, Gabriel, and the others to slay the remaining fallen watchers. We are slowly realizing that there was great technology unfathomable even today. Technology that, among other things, could have caused a massive flood upon the earth and is beyond our imagination. Much of this myth of the Watchers is found to be within the tales of wars and the merging of peoples across the Middle East, between Canaanites, Egyptians, Sumerians, and even Asian civilizations. But the underlying current is a belief in the Shining Ones as the leaders, with Watchers doing their bidding eventually evolving into God with his angelic beings. The term Anunnaki, Anakim, and even Nephilim means those who came down to earth from heaven. They looked down on the people below. They watched. The truth of the story of the Shining Ones and their watchers has been the subject of a purging by many Jewish authorities who were understandably concerned that the myths of these angels and their worship would detract the people from the worship of the one God. With this end, the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jubilees mentioned above were stricken from the accepted list and are now known as Apocrypha or Pseudographa. What we do know, though, is that these watchers continued in what has been described as the underground stream and were called egregors. The term egregor is Greek and means to rouse from sleep, be excited by passion, to be awake, or to watch. Eliphas Levi, the 19th century magician and mystic, speaks of these egregores on numerous occasions and even links them to the giants or watchers spoken of in the Book of Enoch, saying that they take shape and have appeared in the guise of giants. These are the egregores of the Book of Enoch, termed the celestial watchers or egregores by the ancients. Levi also calls these egregores the Anakim, or shining ones, and men of renown or giants of the Bible, and that they are expressed in the myths of various cultures, just as we have been finding. The extremely ancient concept and story of the Shining Ones was still very much alive and being propagated secretly by the mystics of the last few hundred years. These were very much part and parcel of their hidden secrets. What we can glean here, then, is the next extent of the influence of the first origins of secret societies and the Illuminati, both in culture and texts. These Shining Ones are the first we have on paper, so to speak. They have a structure and a basis of authority. They rule over man and are all wise, having their watchers to ensure that their instructions are carried out. Either the Shining Ones are still in power now generations later, or the secret societies of the globe have copied the methods, structure, and symbols over time. 
the great religions of the world have all been created by some secret method, which we now know to be the generative cause of religion. Namely, all these religions and societies are based upon the days of old when the aliens came, created mankind, fostered them, mated with them, did battle, and then apparently disappeared. But there is one fable that gives us a great history of these alien originators, Atlantis. For well over 2,000 years, mankind has grappled with the question, what was Atlantis and where did its people originate? It's time to break apart the myth and reveal the hard evidence and discover Atlantis. So what does the word itself mean and where did it originate? It is named after the Greek Titan god Atlas, who holds up the world on his shoulders. Atlantis is the island of Atlas. According to Plato, Atlantis was a great land and sea power situated in front of the Pillars of Hercules. This great power had existed 9,000 years before Plato. That's about 11,000 years ago. The Atlanteans had conquered much of Europe and Africa. However, when they attempted to invade Athens, the island sank into the ocean in a single day and night of misfortune. The very word Attila means an abode of serpents. It was or is a massive island, sacred to the gods, and sits within Atlantis, somewhere between Europe and America. Proclus believed Atlantis to be real, so too did the historians and philosophers Strabo and Posidonius. A few decades after Plato, Another writer by the name of Theopompus spoke of a land called Meropis. Here a race of men grew twice the size of normal men and inhabited two cities known as Eusebius and Machimus, the pious town and the fighting town. Most scholars believe that Theopompus was in fact imitating or copying Plato and thus much of the detail and lore has merged with the mythology of Atlantis over time. The next actual written work about Atlantis comes from the historian Philio in the first century AD. He claims that the successor of Aristotle, a man named Theophrastus said, and the island of Atlantis which was greater than Africa and Asia, as Plato says in the Timaeus, in one day and night was overwhelmed beneath the sea in consequence of an extraordinary earthquake, an inundation and suddenly disappeared, becoming sea, not indeed navigable, but full of gulfs and eddies. It is interesting that Atlantis was also being compared with the great flood from the Bible, a sudden destruction of populations in ancient antiquity and only remembered now as legend. Scientific evidence does indeed show floods around the globe at various intervals, and some have compared the tsunamis caused by the eruption of Santorini to the biblical flood. In truth, it may be that other cultures wrote of this massive destruction of an entire civilization, but with different names and perspectives. The writer, Ignatius Donnelly, tried to prove that all known civilizations were descended from Atlantis. He drew parallels between the creation stories of various cultures and stated that the true Garden of Eden was really in Atlantis. There are a number of modern claims that we must explore, such as the idea that Atlantis had something to do with ancient aliens. From Lemuria to Avalon, from Atlantis to Valhalla, the real journey starts now. Maybe it's time to forget everything we have been told, 
throw out the preconceptions about an island of circles that sank beneath the waves and open our minds to a brand new possibility that Atlantis was much more than we could ever imagine. Could this be the story of the real Atlantis? Is this the real lost history of mankind itself? This is quite possibly the tale of a mass migration of people such as the world has never seen before or since. For just a moment, let us consider something very strange and bizarre. Let's turn to the concept of Mexico and the vast similarities in myths and place names as Atlantis. And let us imagine that Atlantis, the name, may have something to do with it. A Greek myth emerging from the other side of the Atlantic? Well, not quite. You see, it may in fact be that those people in Mexico have the same or similar names and beliefs as much of the ancient world for a very good reason. That ancient serpent alien worshipping people spread out across the globe and took with them these names and beliefs. In all likelihood, the original people we vaguely call serpent worshippers are ultimately responsible for the world serpentine-related stone megaliths and monoliths. These people are known as the Watchers, or Shining Ones, in the Bible, and are responsible for raising great stone monuments across the world, and were the ones perhaps to conceive of Atlantis. And the originator of the Atlantean myth is the ancient serpent god himself, came from beneath the waters. He came from the place below, Atlantis. Jeffrey Ash in The Ancient Wisdom says, According to one theory, all primordial serpents of myths are derived from a Sumerian arch serpent in subterranean waters, whose name was Zu. Water is, by many myths around the world, the home of the serpent spirit. There are many hundreds of such myths across pagan Europe, changed and altered by the later Christian church, who by their meddling eroded the real history of the Atlanteans that spread their serpent worship and knowledge across the world. Serpent water deities were replaced with saints, such as Brigid of Keldare, the Naga serpent masters of ancient India were also said to live beneath the waters in Patala. In Greek myth, the serpentine god Poseidon and the serpent Typhon were water and spring deities with many watery places taking on their names. Even in the temples of Aesculapius we find the pools of healing, a healing which is directly associated with the serpent. This element of the healing serpent within the water simply crossed over into the water itself, and thereafter, the water became the healing element. Added to this, the very important concept that water was seen as the portal to the other world, and we have an association of the water of the gods healing mankind. Water is in fact seen as the portal to the place where the alien serpents originated. Even beneath the temple in Jerusalem, there is the serpent pool, or dragon pool. The Gnostic Jews, known as the Essene, were said to have used pools to heal and were connected to the healing serpent as their original name. Ophites meant serpent worshippers. It may indeed be that baptism has its root in this idea of the serpent healer being born again to new and eternal life by being submerged into the waters of the serpentine otherworld by returning to Atlantis. A larger version of this basic truth is seen in the story of the flood, the deluge that sank Atlantis and other fabled lands across the world. Could this in fact be an indication that Atlantis simply returned home through the portal to the other world? 
And so we can see, from language, mythology, history, and folklore, that the people we are calling Atlanteans spread across the world, possibly following some cataclysmic event, and took with them knowledge of the healing serpent, astronomy, navigation, and more. And all of this goes right back in time to the origins of civilization itself, to the ancient alien gods themselves. And we must remember that to live beneath the waves, under the sacred waters, was in fact the place of the gods. To live where no human could, to survive in the other world, only the gods could live there. This then is in fact the tale of the divine alien, like angelic beings the Bible calls watchers, otherwise known as the sons of God. The tale of these watchers is found in the legends of Sumeria and even the Old Testament. Sumeria was the land of the watchers, and it is from this land that the Elohim or shining ones who governed the watchers also resided. This is the land of origins and the governing gods. The term Elohim was used often in the Old Testament as a word for God, but it can also be used as the term is plural and means shining ones. The stark fact of the matter is that in the same way a pharaoh of Egypt was a god on earth, so too priests of the Elohim were stars on earth. The Watchers, according to the Book of Jubilees, are the sons of God spoken of in Genesis, sent from their heavenly abode to instruct men. It is the links to these ancient Watchers and Atlanteans that has spawned much of the idea that they were in fact aliens. They fell to earth, did battle in the sky, and more. In the tales of Atlantis, they became the Atlanteans, lost in the mists of time. And yet the true Atlantean story remained alive in the stories of the secret society we know as the Illuminati. In order to find the true Illuminati, you must travel through time and space to find them in every culture of the world over a period that reaches back into ancient Sumeria and Africa and a landscape as diverse as South America and Japan. Yes, that is the truth, because these ancient shining beings traversed the globe taking their spiritual enlightenment and wisdom with them. We know this today as illumination and it gives rise to the term Illuminati. From one learned brother to another, from one master to the next, this knowledge has passed down. The secrets they held within their groups is almost as old as mankind because our originators brought it with them. All trace their descent from the ancient serpentine cults of ancient times and all still hold many of the rituals and beliefs to be found in the earliest of cults. As we have seen, thousands of years ago, a special advanced race of beings came to Earth. They were seen as gods by primitive man and worshipped. They set themselves apart, and yet some mated with humans and created a special race. When the elders departed, this hybrid species remained and taught mankind. Civilization emerged. Writing, art, science, engineering, architecture and more spread around the globe. The human race that had been happy for tens of thousands of years to hunt and gather, now built massive pyramids, cultivated the land, forged steel, and eventually held tiny computers in their hands that enabled them to communicate around the world instantly and discover knowledge with the swipe of a finger. All of this and more is only part of the story, for our benefactors had an ulterior motive. They took control of our minds and hearts. 
They control this world. They control all of us. From the moment you are born, you are numbered and moved through a process to feed their machine. Nobody is truly free. We are all working for the masters. Every now and then, they are revealed to the world. And in the 18th century, we had a glimpse of their massive power. We know them as the Illuminati, and they originated in ancient times. Quote, Throughout Mesopotamia, from the earliest times of Sumer and Akkad, all lands were owned by gods and men were their slaves. Of this, the cuneiform texts leave no doubt whatsoever. Each city-state had its principal god, and the king was described in the very earliest written documents that we have as, quote, the tenant farmer of the god. All the great religions originate in the same historical tales of great lights that descended to earth, taught the humans, brought them out of the Dark Ages, bred them and established rulers and priests. Using propaganda, mind control, and even force, humans were treated like sheep and told to believe and behave. We had to worship the lights in the sky. We had to bow to their representatives on Earth, and we had to pay the priest for the privilege of doing so. Land was taken from us, and we were told to pay to live upon it. To pay, we had to work every waking moment. Then, we had to pay taxes to the relatives of the rulers and priests in government who made laws to keep us controlled. We were thrown into war against our brothers, told to build pyramids and great walls, experimented on, and abused every step of the way. If any of this is sounding familiar, it is simply because absolutely nothing has really changed even though the powers that be would have us believe so. From the 17th century onwards, we believed we had found a way of revolting against this oppression. Across Europe and the US, so-called free men fought against the tyranny. And yet the fact is this. The rulers had people in both camps. The U.S. War of Independence, for instance, was led by men on both sides who were members of the same Freemasonic lodges, who were often themselves descendants of royal stock. The English Civil War ended up with the English begging for a royal to come back on the throne. It was all staged. It has always been staged. The First and Second World Wars changed the political map of Europe, and yet the royals and religions remain. Power cleverly shifts around, but always, at the very top, the same families run the world. Modern control began in the 18th century as a reaction to the growing enlightenment of the human population. The printed word had an unfortunate side effect for those in power. People started to gain knowledge and spread dissent. One very clever method of controlling such dissent is to cause it, own it, and control it. Create your very own group that seemingly goes against the status quo, and not only do you manipulate those who are naturally drawn towards it, you gather your own secondary power base to play around with. One sure way of winning any game is to own both sides. In the 18th century, the modern era of mind control began with the creation of the Illuminati. The name in itself must remind us of the very fact that those who originally came to Earth were the Illuminated Ones. In the 18th century, a Freemason wrote the following words. There are a certain number of people who have arrived at the highest degree of imposture. They have conceived the project of reigning over opinions and of conquering not kingdoms nor provinces, but the human mind. This project is gigantic and has something of madness in it, 
which causes neither alarm nor uneasiness. But when we descend to details, when we regard what passes before our eyes of the hidden principles, when we perceive a sudden revolution in favor of ignorance and incapacity, we must look for the cause of it. And if we find that a revealed and known system explains all the phenomena which succeeded each other with terrifying rapidity, how can we not believe it? Standard history tells us that they were started by Jean Adam Weishaupt, the founder of the Order of the Illuminati. Weishaupt was born in Bavaria on the 6th of February, 1748. His father, Baron Ickstadt, was a professor at the University of Ingolstadt, having married the niece of the curator. The Baron secured a scholarship at the Jesuit College for Adam, who then went on to become a law student at the age of 15. Ingolstadt was a steadfastly Jesuit area and had been for over 200 years. Dissent was not permitted, even though they had been partially suppressed in 1773 by Clement XIV. It has been said of the Jesuits that they were the world's largest and most powerful secret service, due mainly to the fact that they were feared by many in the Catholic Church and that a universal confession could be well utilized for blackmail. According to a converted nun, the Jesuits offer the world at large a system of theology by which every law, divine or human, may be broken with impunity, and by which the very bulls of popes may be defied. It is a ghastly religion. It is a religion to be abhorred by all honest and honorable men. So according to this 19th century writer, they were even above the bulls of the Pope. Edwin A. Sherman, an American Freemason also writing in the 19th century stated, the Jesuits laugh at us and during their hilarity, the rattlesnake is coiled at our feet, climbing to strike us in the heart. Even President Lincoln, who was finally assassinated after prior attempts said, the Jesuits are so expert in those deeds of blood that Henry IV said that it was impossible to escape them, and he became their victim, though he did all he could to protect himself. I know that the Jesuits never forget nor forsake. It seems like a peculiar world that the Jesuits inhabit. On the one hand, they fraternize with Freemasons, royalty and presidents, and on the other, taking an oath which puts them at odds with just about everybody who is not Catholic. It is into this world that Weishaupt was brought up. By 1775, Weishaupt was professor of canon law at Ingolstadt, and it was this year he or somebody else chose for Weishaupt to form a plan of an association of which he would head. This association would, quote, oppose the forces of superstition and lies, or in other words, religion. The thoughts of many commentators is that Weishaupt so hated the Jesuits that he thoroughly intended to do away with them once and for all. The truth is that Weishaupt was in fact trained by the Jesuits for the purpose of raising a worldwide army of spies who would constantly be feeding back information from their own enemies. The information that the Jesuits could not get any more through their confessions. In fact, the Illuminati even set up their own confessions in line with that of the Jesuits. All of this surveillance and confession was fed back to the Jesuits from the very people who were supposed to be against them. How better to find out what was in the mind of the opposition than to be the opposition? This is a standard double ploy utilized for centuries by the secret services of all religions and states. They even fed the anti-Semitic rhetoric which suited the Catholic Church down to the ground. Through associations with the Freemasons, the Jesuits managed to get information from and influence too, the Freemasons of the globe. 
These business leaders, politicians, military commanders, religionists, and so-called free thinkers were in fact being manipulated yet again, and very often with the exact same devices that had been used for thousands of years. Belief in a divine entity, worship of a being of light, otherwise known as Lucifer, and even the concept that their own secret line stretched back to the time of Egypt and beyond. What many probably didn't realize was this. All of that was true. They were being controlled and manipulated by a sacred line that did originate thousands of years ago. And they still are. Following Weishaupt's amazing creation, out of the order of a much older institution, we suddenly have several worldwide revolutions and the balance of power supposedly shifting like never before. The Illuminati stretch right back into the realm of the Shining Ones in Afghanistan. This link is with the Roshanya, or Illuminated Ones, and reference to them comes from the House of Wisdom in Cairo a veritable fount of esoteric knowledge predating the Roshania by hundreds of years. The earliest leader we know of is Bayezid Ansari, who claimed descent from the helpers of Mohammed. Using merchants and soldiers, Bayezid eventually spread his message across the world by word of mouth, and those Gnostics and mystics who heard the message already understood the secret of illumination. As Archon Daral says in Secret Societies, coincidences of dates and beliefs connect these Bavarian Illuminati with the Afghan ones, and also with the other cults which called themselves Illuminated. The beginning of the 17th century saw the foundation of the Illuminated ones in Spain, the Alambrados, condemned in an edict of the Grand Inquisition in 1623. In 1654, the illuminated Guiahine came into public notice in France. Documents still exist that show several points of resemblance between the German and Central Asian Illuminists, points which are hard to account for on the grounds of pure coincidence. Weishaupt founded his Illuminati on May Day, 1776, in Bavaria. He called himself Brother Spartacus, as if mimicking the rebellion from within. There was no democratic leadership, no voting, no equality. The Illuminati was led by clever and powerful people. Very quickly, it set about creating an international network of spies and counter-spies. They set up in cells, with each cell having a secret superior. The structure was closed, with lower levels having no idea who was above them. Weishaupt then targeted the Freemasons and was initiated into the Munich Lodge in 1777. He attempted to reform them, and when this failed, he began recruitment drives within their own lodges. It was a brilliant ploy using a secret society to build a secret society. His stated goal was to perfect human nature through education. He would free people from government and organized religion. In this way, Weishaupt grew his Illuminati rapidly and drew in those who were seen by government and religious leaders as trouble. Claiming to free people from the bounds of society, the Illuminati, in fact, gave them harder rules and regulations to follow. Even their reading literature was prescribed. This was not enlightenment or freedom. This was control of the mind under a veil of deception. Indeed, independent thought and action was forbidden by the rules of the order. Enlightenment, they said would only take place under the guidance of the superior. But he didn't stop there. In fact, he received the financial assistance of Duke Ernest II of Saxe Gotha Altenburg, where he lived and wrote works on Illuminism. 
the very royal and religionist style leader the Illuminati were supposedly against actually funded them. And yet, we are told it was disbanded. We are supposed to believe that thousands of people across Europe suddenly stopped attending Illuminati meetings, that they just gave up. We are told that because the Bavarians had outlawed it, their grand ideas of reducing the dominance of religion and state ended there. And yet, even in 1798, there were rumblings that they had not died. Many even claimed they were behind the French Revolution, which brought down government, royalty, and religion. So powerful was the fear of the Illuminati that Christian preachers gave sermons across Europe and even in the United States. What we do know is that the world was changed. Some royal houses did fall, only to be replaced by people who actually had royal blood. Religion was supposedly attacked and changed. Revolutions occurred across the world, and all this following the creation of the Illuminati and within a very short time period. The surface story looks good for the easily led. The subtle hidden story works well for the conspiracy theorist and free thinker. But the truth is that nothing at all really changed. It was a massive and elaborate smokescreen that served its purpose brilliantly. Free thinkers really did believe they'd made a difference. Here's a brief example of how they made no difference at all. The United Kingdom is a very small place in comparison to many countries in the world, and yet the power it holds is immense. It has a massive commonwealth that includes countries it can call on during times of war, such as Australia, Canada, and more. The head of state for all of these is the present king or queen. That head of state owns huge amounts of land in the world, shares in the world's biggest companies. They are head of the religion and government. They can dissolve parliament any time they wish. Parliament itself is made up of a small number of elected ministers who all have to give way to an unelected house of lords who answer to the king or queen. Beneath the head of state, there are dukes, earls, lords, barons, and more. All of these are in positions of power in government, institutions, media, religion, and companies. They are the ones who hold all the power. Anybody who steps outside of that special bloodline club is immediately taken care of, as perhaps was possibly the case with Princess Diana. Just because every now and then a commoner, although a brilliant one such as Richard Branson, manages to make millions means little. Even he needs permission from the established committees to fly his planes, set up a business, or run his trains. If he or his company steps out of line, then permission is not given. Toe the line, virgin or no virgin. And just because you may live in a republic, don't think for one minute you are immune. Take Hollywood, for example. The stars of Hollywood are themselves treated like royalty. Some step out of line and are consequently no longer required for the major studios. Why? Because the big film companies are largely owned by the same old elite. Many stars are themselves descended from royalty. U.S. comedian Ellen DeGeneres is 15th cousin to Princess Kate Middleton. Angelina Jolie is descended from the kings of France. Brad Pitt is a descendant of King Henry II of England. Hugh Grant is a descendant of King Henry VII of England. Brooke Shields descended from King Henry IV of France. Uma Thurman descended from King Edward I of England. And so on. In fact, the list is extensive, and if we take this further and look at many executives of film, distribution, and studios, then we find a similar story. In the UK, as in America, 
the story is the same. The world-famous BBC is run by several committees, all of which are populated by the same old boys club that sit in the house of so-called lords and were educated by one of those inbred institutions such as Eton. All of these people own the land, buildings, and companies. They run all of the institutions such as the religions, the major charities, the arms companies, chemical giants, media outlets, police, military, and more. They even control access to the stately homes, castles, and places of historical importance. On top of all this, the hidden wealth of these people of the bloodline is enormous. Hidden beneath the Vatican is a treasure trove that could solve all Africa's problems. The British royal family have so much art, jewelry, and antiques that the world's financial problems could be solved very quickly. Add up all the other royal families of the world, the barons and earls, the distant relatives, and friends, and you have a staggering wealth in hidden gems alone. Between the royals, religions, and so-called secret societies of the world, we have much more than just wealth. We have power so vast, it is almost unimaginable. And all of these are part of that very same bloodline that thousands of years ago spawned planet Earth from the beings of light that descended to enslave us. Remember those lines from Mesopotamian cuneiform? That from the earliest times of Sumer and Akkad, all lands were owned by gods, and men were their slaves. These were the Illuminated Ones. In the 18th century, their name re-emerged. They spread, embedded themselves in Freemasonry, controlled people, and forced change. The same Freemasonry that has members from royalty, religion, business, military, police, charity, media, and just about everywhere else. One bloodline to rule them all, and in the darkness blind them. Now, in the 21st century, we are still slaves to the masters who have accumulated vast estates, power, and wealth. We are controlled from birth. We are given a number that must move along with us throughout life. We need that number to get health care, to be allowed to indebt ourselves to their banks, to vote in the mockery they call democracy, to claim a pension we have paid for tenfold. During our lifetime, they have the power to take away our freedom at any point with the police who ultimately do their bidding and enforce their laws, to send us off to war, to force purchase the property they told us we owned, to take away our children and civil rights. We are branded by religion, or even lack of it. Our intelligence is measured, our education controlled and manipulated, and ultimately, we pay for this institutionalized brainwashing. The internet is increasingly a tool for propaganda and mind control. Drugs are mass tested on us as if we're some kind of collective guinea pig. Our food intake is constantly controlled by the nanny state in the same way our entertainment is. The news is carefully chosen by editors who are told what to choose by the owners who are likely connected to members of the elite bloodline. False stories are created to manipulate our minds and trust. Religions are constantly used against us to make us look outward and not inward at our own leaders. And all the while, real people in the world see and experience real events. Thousands and thousands of people have witnessed UFO activity around the globe. In each case, the governments cover up, create false stories, and hide the truth. What does our strictly controlled media say? They disinform and ridicule according to the instructions they are given. 
Humankind is not the master race of planet Earth. Humankind is enslaved to the ancient gods that came down to Earth many thousands of years ago. They have become so deeply embedded within our society that we no longer see them. The universities that translate ancient texts are owned and run by them, and it is they who create the professors, the experts that we, the masses, must listen to. They tell us that the ancient historical texts written by our ancestors are nothing more than religious mythology. That serpent-faced aliens who descended to Earth with fiery weapons and strange craft are all from their bizarre imagination. They then tell us to go to church and pray to imaginary gods of their own design, to make offerings to dead saints, to give ourselves over even more to their systems. So, what is freedom? Unless you can somehow disappear into the wilds of some huge forest and escape all their influence and control, then you are not free. You, me, and everybody else on this planet are subjects of influence. Whether from the TV set, cinema, radio, or supermarket, we are being constantly fed, carefully prepared information that meets the goal of those ancient gods to enslave humanity.